All right, we got Byron Ross here, um, 84 mile per hour exit velocity on the swing. So let's take him in uh, to his swing. So uh, he starts with a little leg kick um, and shift onto the backside, but notice on his stance leg how that knee is collapsing in valgus. So I'd like to see him holding torsion a little more. Um, he's really not sitting into that back hip um, he's really just loading up, collapsing valgus onto that backside. Um, but what he is doing good is at the same time as he's loading up, uh, watch that elbow and shoulder go into horizontal abduction. He's starting to coil um, as that stride foot goes forward. So now he's going to go into foot plant and he does a good job of really pulling apart um, his hip from his shoulders there into that horizontal abduction. Uh, and coiling up into front foot strike. But in that positioning, like I said, he could have done a much better job of holding torsion in his back leg, uh, loading into that big back hip. Uh, that would help him significantly um, with his back hip drive uh, to power the kin kinematic sequence. Uh, as he goes into swing initiation, does a good job of landing and flexion on that front leg. So he's gonna have a really good, um, a really good fulcrum for him to begin his rotation off of, but you're really not gonna see uh, a lot of power, a lot of drive uh, through that back hip. Okay, uh, the seat, uh, notice in this, um, the hand is not connected to the bat. We're having some issues with the sensors where um, working to get that issued out. So just ignore that part. We can still get a good understanding of uh, the lower half sequencing here. I'm going to pull up uh, his kinematic sequence. Take a look at this. Spread this out. Take it a little bit farther back. So this red line is going to be his pelvis. Um, it's on his opposite hip, so that's why you're going to see it in the negative here. Um, so just imagine that this is in the positive. The sensor's just on um, the wrong hip. So he's peaking at uh, 582 degrees per second. Uh, shortly after that, this neon green is going to be his chest, um, and it's peaking at 861. And then this top, at the very top, you can see uh, this uh, light purplish line uh, is going to be the bat. Um, it's peaking at, um, let's see, 2,218. So um, really you would like to see this a little bit more of a separation between his pelvis uh, and chest um, and obviously a higher, uh, a higher amount of uh, degrees per second through that pelvis. Um, so I believe if he had done a better job of holding torsion in that back leg, loading more into that back hip, producing force off of that back leg to drive that hip through, uh, not only would we see the pelvis peak higher, chest is going to peak higher, and ultimately bat is going to peak higher uh, as well. But he does an extremely good job of uh, uh, counter-rotating into front foot strike um, and then uh, landing in flexion, stabilizing, extending that front leg. Uh, and finishing through the ball, producing an exit velocity of 84 miles per hour. So uh, some of the big takeaways for Byron was he's six foot three, 141 pounds when he came into camp. Um, so adding weight, it was going to be significant for him. Uh, uh, also through the strength and conditioning, developing more uh, power as he adds that weight, uh, and then biomechanically really working on producing force uh, out of that backside, back hip, holding torsion, driving hip through. Um, uh, and really using the full kinetic chain to produce uh, swing velocity and exit velocity. All right, we've got Byron Ross here, um, position player, uh, outfielder, and this throw was clocked at 73 miles per hour. So let's take him into this throw. So he's going to get his plant foot step step in here. Okay, and then he's gonna add another shuffle right here. So he built up a little energy through a run-in already. 
So let's take him in um, to his stride. So he is, again, like we seen, saw in the hitting, if we look at this back leg, he's collapsing into a valgus position. He's doing a better job of sitting into his back hip here. But that back leg is going to be extremely hard to produce force uh, through that broken valgus position. So ideally seeing him hold more torsion, uh, even sitting lower into that back hip, lowering his center of gravity. Uh, and also we start to see his trunk start to fall uh, ipsilateral. So uh, he's beginning to fall uh, inwards uh, and he's going to start trying to produce force from this broken valgus position. So here he is beginning to try to drive out of that position. At the same time, uh, he gets into a very, very excessive uh, uh, horizontal abduction uh, and really not a lot of uh, thoracic rotation uh, uh, to be able to support this. So this is, this is gonna be getting him into a vulnerable position here um, as he goes into shoulder rotation. So we see him trying to drive out of that back leg to get the hips to go in front. But since he didn't have enough energy and he was driving from that broken position uh, to drive through the hips, he's not going to get um, a ton of, of hip to shoulder separation. Let's pull up um, his hips and shoulder lines. Okay, so he's going to get a little bit of hip to shoulder separation here, but what we're seeing is that arm going so far into horizontal abduction. It almost looks like, you know, a chicken bone at this point. Um, and that energy uh, uh, not driving through the hip, not getting that hip to drive through enough. Um, and then if we pull up this graph, I can already see he's really early trunk rotating um, with that lead arm. So let's pull up his kinematic sequence here. Take a look at this. All right, um, let's see, where's his pelvis at? Okay, his pelvis is peaking here. All right, this red line is his pelvis. He's peaking at 667 degrees per second. Uh, but before that, we see his lead arm pinks, uh, peak. So this is uh, this this uh, blue line is going to be. I know it's kind of hard to see here. I'm gonna I'll pull this apart. So this blue line is going to be his lead arm. It's peaking before uh, his pelvis, chest, um, and throwing arm. So that's really showing he didn't have enough energy moving through his lower half. So he's going to start pulling with that glove side to try to create more of that energy. Um, uh, then he goes into his pelvis, um, 667 degrees per second, then goes to his chest, which looks like it's peaking at about 930 degrees per second, um, and then uh, chest and trail arm are pretty much peaking and going off at, uh, uh, trail arm being his throwing arm, going off at the same time. Uh, trail arm is peaking at 1614 degrees per second, and then finally his trail forearm peaks, uh, uh, peaks at the highest. So. Really what we're seeing, that lack of energy being driven through the hip uh, to get that hip to go forward. He's still slightly in a closed position. Let's start getting him more into that shoulder rotation. So as he gets into his throw, let's see, about there, the hip to shoulder separation is gone and what we really see uh, is aggressive um, arm drag, so a lot of uh, um, a lot of hyperangulation, which is going to be extremely hard um, on that shoulder uh, and elbow as he goes into his throat. Let's take a look at the front leg, landed in decent flexion, uh, doesn't really stabilize, extend, um, and then as he finishes, he's falling over that front side, so he didn't stabilize um, and stop that energy completely effectively, uh, uh, extend back into the trunk to get uh, to accelerate that forward trunk tilt, um, which would have, you know, increased ball velocity alone on that, and also given him a more stable fulcrum for him uh, to initiate the shoulder rotation off of. So big key takeaways from it: um, driving from that valgus position didn't have enough energy coming up through the drive leg. Uh, since there wasn't enough energy heading towards the target through the drive leg uh, producing linear force, he really aggressively had to pull uh, glove side, um, which is going to cause that hyperangulation. Also, he's uh, very aggressively um, horizontally abducting 
um, his throwing arm. Uh, that's really just him trying his best to separate and delay that arm as long as possible, but that's going to be extremely unhealthy uh, on the arm. Uh, so really working to uh, develop more power through the drive leg, develop more front leg stabilization and extension, uh, uh, working to get that hip to shoulder separation so he's not uh, um, drastically horizontally abducting that arm uh, and then working to get uh, uh, more uh, forward trunk tilt which is going to be um, from that front leg stabilization extension and also the product of the energy that he provided from the back leg uh, as well. Okay, we have Byron Ross here. Uh, in his 10 yard dash, we have him clocked here at 159. So let's take him into this sprint. So again, looking at drive leg, uh, still collapsing on that, um, collapsing off of that back leg. It's in a, it's in a valgus position to start. We'd like to see him holding a little bit more torsion. Also too, he's starting really vertical uh, for a steel break. We'd like to see a little more flexion in the knees and in the hips initially to start. Um, going into his, his um, starting style, he's really utilizing a jab step. I don't like the jab step. Um, a lot of studies have shown it's the least efficient form uh, of a steel break, so I'd like to see him utilizing more of either a crossover step or a drop step. Um, that jab step is just, it's, it's too inefficient. It's almost like if you're on the mound and you're swinging that front leg to produce uh, your initial initial force as opposed to driving off of the back leg. So that's what you really see here is that front leg swinging out. Now he's going to step and he's really relying on that uh, that left leg to produce the force as that that back leg has been pulled out of its um, out of a good load position. Uh, so he'll just get a little kick off the back leg. Now he has to absorb on that front leg and really rely on that uh, leg to begin producing force. Uh, whereas with a crossover step and or a drop step, you can begin producing force in the direction of the base much more quickly. Um, so going into his next steps, he does a pretty good job of creating uh, triple extension and drive. We could do a better job of, well, he's doing a pretty decent job of a, of a forward lean, but I think we could get better uh, with his forward lean. And yeah, definitely as he begins into it. So he did a good job initially with his forward lean, but very quickly he starts standing up well, uh, well too premature. So definitely through the first 10 yards, working to keep that better forward lean, uh, working to keep um, more torsion in the drive leg to start, and then working more on a crossover step or a drop step initially, uh, as opposed to doing this jab step um, out of that position. Again, uh, Byron's a, a really quick uh, athlete, uh, came into camp at 141 pounds, left at 171 pounds. Um, so adding that size uh, we knew was gonna significantly help um, with his throwing velocity, sprint speed, and exit velocity. All three of those uh, went up. His throwing velocity went to 88 miles per hour. Um, his uh, uh, exit velocity went to 90 miles per hour. Um, and his sprint speed, I believe, went down to a one, a one five one. So, uh, all of that force really helped him uh, produce um, more efficient power uh, through every detail of, of his of his baseball game. So, sprinting, uh, throwing, and hitting. And uh, biomechanically, like I said. Um, he was doing things somewhat decent, just needed a, a few uh, little tweaks here and there, uh, but definitely adding that power uh, through the weight training and the nutrition was significant for uh, his success.